<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our virtual field trips. I'm Casey, the donor stewardship and social media manager at Washington's National Park Fund. In case you don't know who Washington's National Park Fund is, also known as WNPF, we are the official nonprofit partner for Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. We're fortunate and honored to work closely with these parks and their superintendents as we work to fund 30 to 40 priority projects every single year. Before we start, there are a few housekeeping items. This trip is 45 minutes long with a presentation from our speakers and a Q&A portion at the end. So feel free to enter any questions in the box as we go. And there's also closed captioning in the uh, buttons in the menu for your Zoom. Um, and we welcome any feedback as we work to make these trips as accessible as possible. So let's get started. November celebrates Native National, sorry, <laughs> November celebrates Native American Heritage Month. And we're excited to highlight today's topic. This past summer's historic all native climb of Tahoma, also known as Mount Rainier. Washington's National Park Fund acknowledges the fact that the parks that we partner with closely, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic, are situated on the ancestral lands of many tribal nations. In particular, for the land administered as Mount Rainier National Park, it has been the ancestral homeland of the Cowlitz, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, Yakima, and Coast Salish people since time immemorial. We celebrate the first stewards of these lands and seascapes and recognize the continued deep connection to these special places. Their voices are and will forever be vital in protecting, preserving, and sharing their homelands with the world. If you're interested in learning more about the park projects that engage with and honor local tribes and their culture, visit wnpf.org slash blog and you can find our Native American Heritage Month blog right at the top. Excuse me. So are you ready to meet our speakers? Today, we are joined with Rachel Heaton. She's the organizer of this monumental climb. She's also a mother, a member of the Muckleshoot tribe, and a descendant of the Duwamish people. She is a culture educator for her tribe, working to learn, build, and sustain cultural practices. Rachel will talk about how this climb came together, why it's important, and the work that, happened, that made it all happen. And then we'll hear personal experiences on Tahoma from two of our other climbers, Gil and Mercedes. Gil Adame is also a member of the Muckleshoot tribe. His, he is Rachel's partner and currently works with the Muckleshoot tribal court system. He hopes to inspire more youth to find their purpose, whether it's through sharing his stories or by his actions. Mercedes Sosa is also a member of the Muckleshoot tribe and she is Rachel's daughter. She's a certified personal trainer, educator, and a licensed master esthetician. Rachel was one of her inspirations when it came to her fitness journey and becoming a personal trainer, and she's always had a passion for helping people take care of their bodies. We are so excited to dive in, so uh, let's talk about this climb, and Rachel, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Rachel Heaton, and again, I am a Muckleshoot tribal member and a descendant of the Duwamish people. Um, first, I want to say I'm truly honored uh, to be on here today. So thank you, Washington National Parks Fund. I see Kristen's on here and Alex is on here. So hi to you guys, even if I can't see you, I know you're there. <laughs> but um, yeah, so about this climb, um, gosh, it's it's definitely been, it was over a year in the making. I know back in um, 2021, I really started venturing outside. I had been working in culture for a while um, and my previous uh, experience and time out at Standing Rock had led me to being outdoors just in a short narrative of that. And, um, and so then in 2017, I found out that I was going to be a mother again. And um, I know at that point in my life, I had felt like uh, some of my freedom had changed because I was so used to being able to like go to the gym. And that was really like my mental health place. Um, I had also been a professional bodybuilder or a a competitive bodybuilder in the past and uh, owned a gym. So that's always kind of been in my life. And so when I found out about, you know, um, having 
you know, another child and everything, I, I was kind of in this place in my life where I'm like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get back out into the, how am I going to like keep up on my sanity? Cause it was kind of my go-to for my mental health and um, also just keeping my body strong and, and, and using that as an, to be an example to my kids. And so um, fast forward, I have this baby and I can't go to the gym as freely. And so I thought, wow, I'm going to use some of those components that I was using in the gym, like, um, you know, resistance, he was going to be my weight outside. And then I'm going to use hiking as my cardio. And so that kind of started that venture of like getting outside and, you know, our little hikes turned into bigger hikes and bigger hikes turned into more elevation. And I started venturing out to Mount Tahoma, which is Mount Rainier, started venturing out there. And what I found was that my people were not out there. Like we, we weren't hiking in those spaces. We weren't visible in those spaces. And so to me, I thought, well, that means our language isn't out there. Our knowledge isn't out there. Um, and everything that we contribute to these spaces and, and have since time immemorial. So um, I thought, well, I need to get out on the mountain and I need to be even more visible. So I had told, actually I told Gil in 2021 that I wanted to attempt summiting Mount Rainier, not having any idea what goes into that. Um, and so I did in October 21, I signed up for a climb and uh, ended up failing. <laughs> It was it was a squash because I ended up having to turn around. Uh, I had no idea what I was going into. Um, and that was one importance to piece of this climb was not having the resources and the people like there's no no matter how many YouTube videos you watch, it never prepares you for what you experience on the mountain. And so from that point, um, I was able to rec uh, let my ego go for a little bit, I, even though um, my ego crushed me after that first climb, um, you know, he, Gil helped me realize like what the bigger goal of what the climb was really about. And it was about creating the visibility of our people being out in those spaces. So I went to the climbing company and, you know, told them why I wanted to be out there and why this was important. And in that process of getting ready for this climb, um, Alex uh, actually got a hold of me and had read an article about the climb that I was doing and had expressed, um, you know, Washington National Parks Fund had wanted to come meet with me. So they came out to the casino and we had lunch and we talked about the work that I was doing. And um, and so from that lunch, uh, there was a follow-up and they were like, I've talked to our donors and we would like to fund the first native climb. And we would like to, we would like you to, um, lead. And so that's kind of how the work started. And so from that point, um, we had seven clients, seven of us climbers, um, as you can see, they're all in the pictures. And um, yeah, and so we began training once I was able to get everyone together. And um, of course, there's tons more that we could share, but I know I have a small amount of time and I want to give Mercedes and Gil a chance to share their experience. But um you know, as time came, came, you know, closer to the climb, you know, REI came on board, um, Washington National Parks Fund was able to fund this entire climb for us. And so with REI on board, and then we had um, international mountain guides that would be guiding us up the mountain um, was on board. And we also had gotten help from Patagonia. And, and then Emilio, who helped uh, design our logo, kind of all these pieces came together over the year, which led to the climb that took place on September 2nd of this year. And again, you know, the big goal of this is creating visibility of native people being in these spaces. It's really important that our knowledge is out there, our language, um, especially when we are addressing issues such as the, you know, the climate crisis that we're faced with, glaciers melting. It's important that our indigenous knowledge is out in those spaces. And so this climb has allowed me to share that narrative, but also experience this with an amazing uh, team. And so um, I'm happy for you guys to get to hear from them today. And um, yeah, thank you for having us.
So I'm not sure if Mercedes or Gil is going first, but it's up to you two. I think that's you, Gil. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mercedes. It's awesome. <laughs> um, my name is Gil Adami. Um, I'm a Muckle Shoot Travel member. Um, so what what encouraged me to step up and um, join this climb is um, Rachel told me I had to. So <laughs> I'm kidding. We've had several conversations, me and Rachel had several conversations about, you know, what it looked like if I went up, you know, if I, if I climbed the mountain and what would be the purpose of me doing this. And um, it takes me back to my childhood to um, things that I was told I couldn't do. You know, from the start when I was in, uh, you know, middle school, I guess, um, I had teachers telling me that I can be, you know, a great farmer or a great landscaper or a great mechanic, you know, all those stereotypical jobs, you know. So I started uh, pushing myself to do things that I, you know, thought, you say I can't do it, but I'm going to do it. But I did it in a negative way. And um, I ended up doing you know, a bunch of things in my past that, you know, I'm not proud of today, but it led me to be who I am. And um, I ended up in jail and then I ended up in prison. And um, uh, I, you know, I don't, I've never, you know, read any stories or um, I, I don't know of any, you know, ex-felons out there that have, you know, been on this journey to where, you know, they know like, they have a partner and a support system that says, you know what, you can be in these spaces, you can do these type of things until Rachel came along. And, um, you know, doing this with a team that I never knew that I could connect with so much, you know, meant everything to me, you know, <clears throat> coming from the background that I have to, you know, be able to do something like this is very important for me to teach my kids and to teach their friends because I'm Muckleshoe and Chicano and, um, now I get to tell them these stories of myself and our, and our team, you know, to say, Hey, you can get in these spaces. You, you can climb these mountains and any other metaphorical mountain, you know, out there, you can come from a life of, um, um negativity and turn around and be positive. So, um, I work in the Muckleshoot court system now, and I help kids like myself, you know, um, help them believe in themselves, help motivate them and get them out of the system so they don't end up like me and be in the system for 28 years. Um, but one of the things I learned about myself is that <clears throat> for myself, I know I need a great support system and a great team around me in order to progress in the way I want to. And what I learned from Mercedes and, <clears throat> and Taylor and, and Jennifer and Rita and Steven and Rachel is, is to, um, you know, be kind and be, be um, passionate about my next steps in life and, you know, just growing into a better me and having the kids that I work with understand they can do better and they can value themselves uh, as they, as they grow up and they don't need to be in the system to have an understanding of that. Cause I was in that system for, like I said, 28 years, but this mountain helped me understand, like I can help kids better understand understand themselves yeah your turn Mercedes <laughs> all righty well um man for me this this time was huge it was not just like you know obviously we made history I make that sound like such a small thing but for me it was like I got to actually see my mom and like see what she's doing not only for like me but for our community and putting um natives back on the mountain because I mean at the end of the day that's it's kind of like where we're supposed to be uh, um but also like it was mentally challenging um me and my mom like we we trained for three, four months. I mean, she was training before me. I was the baby who like ended up coming in late on the climb. Um, and so, you know, me, I was like, 
I really want to go. I want to do this. And not only that, but it was just an amazing bonding experience to have to trust people that I barely even know <laughs> and, um, you know, let them lower me into a crevasse and, <laughs> and guide me up this mountain. It was, it was definitely a, a huge and amazing accomplishment. And it was one of those things where I do get to tell this to my kids when I have them. And um, I, our names are going to be in history books. Um, because this was so monumental and so amazing and I honestly I had such a big ego going up I was like I got this I'm not gonna bog I'm gonna be fine camp's right there and I was <laughs> right when we were about to get to camp I was like I could turn around right now and get back to the car and we'll be fine <laughs> like it was the biggest mental challenge but I know that this was one of those things that is a huge inspiration. It's going to be a huge inspiration for Native kids who do want to go. I'm so sorry. There's like all the noise in the background. Um, this is going to be huge for Native kids when they see that, you know, somebody who looks like me, who is in my situation, like they can get up onto that mountain just like she did and, you know, see this. And one, it was an amazing view. So I was like, this is, nobody in human history has ever seen anything like this it was like being in an airplane without being in an airplane so I mean I just I can't wait to do it again we are gonna do it again Gil's definitely doing it again for sure he's shaking his head no but I'm saying yes <laughs> um but no it was just an all-around amazing experience and I can't wait to do it again I love that mountain and I love the people that we went with I wouldn't have traded in that for the world. Thank you both for sharing. Um, I've got a few questions here that we can kind of go through. And then um, in a few minutes, we'll open it up to our audience. But um, I kind of want to dive deeper into this climb. So Rachel, can you talk a little bit about um, the days on the climb and what y'all did um, for folks that haven't been mountaineering before or um, for hopes for folks who don't even know what happened on the mountain can you kind of just give us a play-by-play -play? yeah um well of course leading up to the climb uh we we had all had group we had team uh practices of going out on the mountain and uh it just experiencing because um you know before, you know, myself doing the climb, um, the other climbers had never done any mountaineering. So this was all new. And um, we had to go to REI and, and everybody got fitted. Um, just because, you know, that's the thing about Mount Tahoma is, is she's a technical mountain, which means that you need different equipment than you do if you're just hiking or you're on a mountain without glaciers. And that's what makes her so different is she's a glaciated mountain. So we had to use crampons and ice axes and helmets and walking on rope teams. And um, that was a new experience for every, for every one of, you know, for everyone that was on the team. And so um, the, one of the pictures that you see where we're all facing um, the gentleman, and I think that's Jackson in the yellow coat, that's one of our guides. Uh, we had to do snow school up there. And, uh, and so, and that was again, like starting to work with the technical equipment, learning how to walk on crampons, putting them on. But um, that first day uh, was really intense. The first day on the climb, um, you can see everyone sitting um, in a group and all you can see is a staring out into the fog. And that was literally what our entire first day was, uh, was fog. And we actually ended up having to wear crampons for majority of the day. A lot of times you don't use your crampons until you get up past Camp Murr, which is the base camp that we were staying at. And we ended up having to use them from the get-go. And we walk, had to walk over rocks and you could see nothing all day long. And you can see how like mentally that will mess with you when you can't see where you're going. And it was, it was cold and, um, 
so yeah, so there was just a lot of different, you know, variables that really played out that first day. But once we got up uh, at base camp, I mean, the view was amazing. We were above the clouds the entire time. We um, got the chance to get lowered into crevasses and just see what that looked like. Um, it was definitely a different world. Um, you know, we we did have the the one day we were going to go up to the high camp up on Ingram Glacier, it was just rock slides all day long. Like you could just hear these massive rock slides. And um, I remember our, our guide, me and Gil had talked about it because, you know, in native culture, we always talk about listening to nature and listening to what she says to us. And, um, you know, we were trying to navigate the Cowlitz Glacier that day, and it was just massive rock slide. And the more that we were trying to navigate around the crevasses, those rocks were getting closer and closer to us. And uh, Riley, our, our lead guide, had told us, you know, you, normally she whispers, but today she's shouting. And, and we understood what that meant because we knew what that means when you're listening and being in, you know, listening to your instincts out there, but also listening to nature. And uh, she was basically telling us like, you're going to risk your life if you go keep trying to navigate e any closer to these rock slides. So we made the determination or our guides did at that point who were amazing. We had, we had five amazing guides that took great care of us. And we ended up having to turn around and go back to Camp Murr, but just being out there and knowing like how how important safety is, how important it is to listen and not push beyond those measures of, you know, when the mountain is speaking to you, don't don't force yourself into those spaces. And um, so yeah, but overall, you know, we experienced a lot, but you know, we learned a lot about the team, but safety was super important on this one, just with the mountain deteriorating at this time of year. And you know, as we see, you know, climate change kick in, you know, more and more and more, you know, the seasons are getting shorter and shorter. And so I think these are definitely like conversations and stuff that we should be having. But um, the experience overall was great. And we all learned a lot, but it was physically and mentally, you know, very challenging to be out there. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I climbed uh, two years ago and we had to turn around at Ingram Flats because of the same reason, like everything was just melting and it was terrifying. And <laughs> I was very happy to just say, you know what, safety's first. <laughs> Summit is not the number one priority <laughs> and it should not ever be. So yeah, Absolutely. I'm, I'm such a big fan of the guide. So I'm very thankful that um, your entire team came back all in one piece. Um, talking about the team, how did you, because you were one of the only ones that had known what to expect on a climb, Rachel, mm -hmm. so how did you convince six other people to join you on this wild adventure? <laughs> I made it sound super cool and I forced them all to do it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it, it kind of, <laughs> it organically came together, you know, um, Jennifer, I had done work with, you know, through activism and just different circles in our native community. And she, you know, through conversation had expressed, you know, wanting, you know, to, you know, she loved hiking and, and expressed wanting to eventually summit. And so it felt natural to ask her, you know, to, to go on the climb. Um, my, my significant other Gil there, he um, does these awesome videos and it just felt natural to, you know, to talk to him about documenting out there and capturing what was happening, um, especially being the first native team, you know, to ever do this. Um, it was very monumental to make sure that we captured, you know, what was going on up there and what we felt and um, how just things were coming together. Um, Taylor, uh, she was our youngest uh, person on the team. And it's funny because I was actually doing a presentation at our tribal school about a snow school with one of the climbing companies that I do work with. And she happened to be there doing a presentation. And so she um, had heard about, you know, this climb and, you know, what I was, you know, trying to do. 
And it was funny because she was trying to convince her coworker to go and she ended up reaching out to me, you know, saying that she was, you know, interested if that was something that I would potentially be open to. And so I had her and also my friendship with Rita um, and she had known me through my activism and the work that I had done. And she too, you know, had expressed being a hiker. Cause that's all, that's all I was really able to reach out to because nobody was a mountaineer. So it had to be people who were okay being outdoors. And so, um, and then Stephen Gray, which is Rita's husband, um, it was, he, he just retired from being a professional basketball player overseas. And he too was kind of looking for kind of what's that next thing that's going to challenge me, you know, especially coming out of, you know, professional ball playing. And, um, and so when I was putting the team together, you know, and asked, you know, you know, would Steven be interested? And she was, and so, um, I jumped on a call with them and they, they came on board. And so, yeah, the team just kind of organically, you know, came together and, and I couldn't have asked for a better group of people. Every person's very different, very versatile in different ways, but, um, everybody was willing to do the training and their own programs and, um, combined with our team practices. I know Kristen got to come out with us and Michael from REI got to come out with us and, um, so we got to experience it with just all different groups of people and yeah, it turned out to be a really great climb. And like I said, we had five awesome, you know, guides that, you know, took our safety serious and made it, um, a pleasurable climb as much as that, that can even happen up there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's, that's really how the, you know, and then Mercedes, she had just came back from Hawaii and, um, she actually attended the snow school with me and got to experience like being on a rope and learning how to, you know, um, descend, you know, down, a, a, you know, the sides of like the, the rocks and, and things. And I had told her, you know, Hey, if, if you do some research about what it takes to climb this mountain and you're still interested after you, you know, do this research, let me know. And yeah. And then that's how she came on board and that made up our whole team. <laughs> Well, based off of all the photos that I've been seeing, it seems like you had a really good group of climbers with you. So yeah, yeah, can't trade that for anything else. Um, Definitely not, not <laughs> in stressful moments at all. <laughs> yeah, <obviously. laughs> uh, in the blog that we posted about your climb, you mentioned, quote, mountaineering is very much about getting to the summit more so than reflecting on the space you're in and the spiritual impact of it. So while you or all three of you, um, I'd love to hear from Gil or Mercedes as well. Uh, while you were on the mountain doing rest steps and breathing heavily and having time in your own thoughts, um, what were some reflections that you were having, something that you learned about yourself or something that you wanted to bring home and apply in your life moving forward? It's a pretty heavy question, so <laughs> take your time. <laughs> Yeah, I have a feeling Gil's going to make me go first because I, I made him go first. So, um, so for me, I, you know, I was more, when I came down the mountain, I, it was funny because I had this philosophy on the way down that I wasn't going to fall and I fell quite a few times and it hurt my ego more than anything. And because I was like, I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to. And then I fell and I was like, I'm yeah. I was so over it. And I just, it taught me to be patient with myself more than anything. And always like, always understanding that no matter what you do, no matter how much you tell yourself, you're not going to fall. Like you're going to fall. You're going to like, it's, and it's going to hurt. And it's going to hurt your pride when you do. And you just got to keep up. You got to keep going. You're not allowed to roll down the mountain and take the easy way out. <laughs> like you have to, it, and not only that, but like it, um, it was also something to where I was like, you know what, if I can do this, I can do just about anything to, that takes me up a mountain, that takes me down a mountain, whether that's a mental mountain 
uh, emotional mountain, you know, or, or physical one. Like it, it was, it was something that I can bring home. Like Mercedes, like you've got this, like you can get through anything, but always understand you're going to fall and you have to be okay with it. And it's going to hurt. And I was like, okay, fine. But, and also like, it's about the journey, not the destination. The journey was the whole part. Cause once we got there, I was like, oh, nice. And then I was like, okay, I don't want to leave. But it's like, no, you're going to have to leave. <laughs> you can't live on the mountain. <laughs> so go ahead, Gil, take it away. Betty, what did you take away? <laughs> Okay. Um, so I didn't vocally complain, you know, going up the mountain, but I complained in my head all the time. Like I was like, I'm, I'm good. Like, I don't care if anybody says anything. I'm going back down. My leg hurts. I'm sick. I'm gonna tell Rachel, like you guys go on without me. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I was, but that was all in my head. And just like Mercedes said, you know, um, Rachel knows I'm a pretty impatient person. Like, Everything's very urgent, even getting out of my car and going into my house. Like I'm grabbing the keys and everything and everything's all piled up. And Rachel's like, what are you doing? But um, I learned <clears throat> how to be patient, how to, um, you know, understand that by thinking about my next step is um, like crucial to even my life right now. Like what's in store for me, like understanding, like I'm where I'm supposed to be. Um, yeah, I learned um, that I'm mentally and physically tougher than I thought I was. You know, um, there's this place in Idaho called Balance Rock that um, Rachel and I hiked, I don't know, like last year thing, but it, it wasn't nearly as high. And I was complaining like, oh, no, I can't do this. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go up. I, I can't do it. And it ended up being really easy. Um, but um, yeah, I have to learn that, you know, the things are meant for me, they're, they're, they're gonna come to me and I have to be patient and wait for them opportunities to happen. Um, but yeah, climbing this mountain was definitely one of the hardest, most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life. And about next year's climb, we'll see. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I love that. I, I love, you know, coming out of really difficult um, situations like these, like mountaineering or even just a hard hike. And you're like, you know what? I, I did that. Like, this is, I can keep going. We can keep doing more hard things. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing to realize. Um, Rachel, as a, a big part of why this climb came together, you mentioned was to ensure that tribal, tribal voices we're represented on the mountain. And that's been a common theme throughout um, anytime we hear you speak and throughout all the stories and um, engagements that you've had. Were there, oh, where did my question go? <laughs> um, after returning and sharing the story back to your community and just to the public, um, how was it received? Were more folks in your community wanting to climb? Were there any unexpected surprises that came out of this climb? Like what happened after you returned? Well, we did. Um, we did a cool podcast with REI. And so we got to share our, you know, our story in that way. And there were actual recordings, you know, from the climbers on there to, you know, allow others to hear those experiences. And so besides the media stuff, um, yeah, surprisingly, there were more tribal people that were like, hey, if you do another climb, you know, I, I I would love to climb. Like, I want that experience. And I mean, at that point, I think the climb was so fresh. I'm like, I don't think I'll be doing that. That's not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but, you know, um, you know, and like I said, that's it's funny because it's just in that moment of, you know, being off of the mountain and you're still like, the physicality of it, the mental part of it was still raw. So it was just kind of, you know, I didn't go into this to become a mountaineer. I, I started doing this simply to be a visible force in that space so that our people would want to see themselves in the space. Um, I've actually gotten the chance to lead some hikes um, on the mountain, uh, just lowland hikes before the snow came in. 
And um, I've gotten the chance to connect with other communities now, like, you know, Washington Trails Association, who has also seen the climb and, and are actually wanting to create relationships with Native communities. And I feel honored to be a resource and a connector, you know, of those things. So I believe a lot of great things will come from this climb and inspire you know, our people to get out there more and, and, and organizations like Washington National Park Fund and REI and IMG and, you know, those companies to work more with our communities and learn from us. So. Thank you. Um, I, I switched it to this photo because like I mentioned earlier, this is one of my favorite photos. I feel like it just really shows how close and how meaningful this climb was to all of you. Um, I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about how your view of the mountain, Tahoma, has changed since this climb? I'm gonna direct it to Gil first since he's <laughs> ready to chat. chat. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you say that again? Uh, I'm curious to hear how your view of the mountain itself, Tahoma, has changed since you've um, gone through this experience. Yeah, so it's a it's um it's an interesting like my way of thinking about it's pretty interesting. If you haven't been out there, um, Mount Tahoma looks it looks she looks scary, she looks intimidating, she looks like I'm never gonna do that. And then when Rachel's like, we're gonna climb this, I'm like, it seems impossible. Although there was um, rock falls and, and you know the, the ice is melting and it's and it's uh, it's tough terrain out there, it, it was it was in a weird way it was. She was, I don't know if you're gonna, you're gonna understand this, but she was much kinder and softer while you were on on her. Like instead of like looking at her from the road, like when I was, I, I felt like, and there's a lot of. Um, places that aren't safe, but I felt safe being up there, being with the team, being with the guides. But if you're looking at it from the road, very intimidating. You know, it's it's tough out there, but she seemed to be kinder. Yeah, that's that's my take. Mercedes. <laughs> okay. Um, no, for me, I, well, I mean, I always looked at her and I was like, yeah, she's a, she's a beautiful mountain. But I felt like once I was, once we were on, on her, like we were just on the mountain, I was like, no, like she's, she is gorgeous. Like inside and out, like <clears throat> part of me felt like I was, I don't like kind of homesick, but like, like I felt like when we were leaving, like I was leaving home. Like it wasn't like, I wasn't leaving a hike like I normally do and going back to the parking lot. Part of me felt as though I was separating from like a dear friend. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna come back. And now when I am home and I'm driving, like I, I look at her and I'm just like, oh my goodness, like I can't wait to go back up there. And, and so, it, it gave me a new appreciation of like, not I have to conquer this mountain, but like, no, I, I appreciate her. I appreciate her beauty and that softness that Gil was kind of talking about. Yeah, from the road, she does look pretty scary, but to actually be on, on Tahoma, um, it, was, it was almost like you were at home. And yeah, the rock falls were scary, but yeah, it was, it was almost, it was very soothing. <laughs> It's very soothing for sure. Mom, your turn. <laughs> I'll just wait for the next question. <laughs> that, yeah, I I love that. I I love the way that you described the mountain as having like softer features, and that's a totally different way that I've ever thought about it. So thank you for that perspective. <laughs> um, one more question before we open up to Q&A and then we do have to start wrapping up, but um, what is next for you? I'm very curious. Are any of you climbing again? Are you not climbing again? <laughs> What's next? 
So actually this coming year, uh, 2024, is the 125th anniversary for Mount Tahoma, Mount Rainier. And actually all three of us and um, Jennifer will actually be on an anniversary climb. And, um, you know, part of that too is we all know the narrative of national parks. National parks were created to move indigenous people out of those spaces. And so with this coming, this anniversary coming up, you know, part of that narrative is like, what does the, what does the narrative for national parks look like go, moving forward? And I think us being a part of that climb um, along with some other great folks, I think, uh, I think that's super important to understand. Now we are already, now we are in this space. So now what does that look like for the mountain and, you know, the national park, but not just Mount Tahoma, Mount Rainier, but all national parks, you know, and, and involving indigenous communities in their narratives, in their storytelling, and creating visibility for those groups to be in those spaces. So yeah, so we all have training coming up again, and we'll be back out there and getting ready to do the mountain in August of this next year. <laughs> That's so exciting. What a lovely, lovely way to celebrate and celebrate the next 125 years. I love that theme. Okay, we're gonna open it up to questions real quick. I've got a couple here. Um, this first one is from Kristen, actually. <laughs> she said, I know you all built a, an incredible relationship with the IMG guides. It seemed like they were really moved by um, why you were out there and the purpose behind this climb. Can you talk a little bit more about that? You guys want me to take it? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, IMG, uh, you know, were our guides out there and uh, they had us with five great people. Um, and, you know, and part of, you know, our work as, as Native people being in those spaces is to also educate the folks who regularly get the privilege to be on the mountain. And that's what I try to share with the guides on other climbs that I've been on is like, you have the privilege of being in that mountain and, and carrying a narrative when you're educating or sharing stories with the folks that you're guiding up those mountains. And, um, you know, having seven natives, you know, uh, and five non-natives, you know, they, all of them were extremely receptive of the knowledge that we shared. And, um, part of that was just creating connection with the land. Instead of making climbs being so transactional and that whole let's conquer the summit, you know, we got the chance to sit down with them and tell them the importance of indigenous knowledge being in those spaces. But beyond just our knowledge, but just as individuals, how do we connect to those spaces? How do we connect be beyond, you know, um, just recognizing that we're guiding people up. Like, how do we talk about the plants? How do we talk about the terrain? How do we talk about the history that has taken place on those lands? And we got the chance to do that. And, you know, the guides that we had, you know, Jackson, Riley, Fritz and Brandon and Paul all were extremely open and receptive and in that process literally had our lives in their hands and we felt safe. And so, I feel like we created this receptive relationship with them. And because we we educated them, but they also took care and educated us on how to be in that safe in that space. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of IMG and uh, we love doing climbs with them. So I'm I'm excited for them to hear this coming from you, Rico. Thanks. Um, we've got one last question. Um, says, are there other ways that you're involved with bringing Native groups to Mount Rainier um, that are not technical? So like things like plant harvesting, historical, cultural practices, um, are you helping to bring youth experiences to these places? Can you talk a little bit more about the other work that you do in, around the park? Um, so I have, I, I feel like that's been one of the privilege that I've gotten by creating like meeting these wonderful resourceful folks and companies that are out there. Um, I, I do have a, a business called the earth gym. And so I, you know, have gotten the chance to take folks out on the land and talk about 
the traditional plants because um, our people have been around the base of this mountain and on the mountain for thousands of years and um, have harvested those lands and traveled across those lands to get from village to village. Um, our water sources run off of the mountain. And so, um, yeah, anytime that I get the chance to take groups outside, um, I, I do that. And, and in 2024, we will actually be doing more of that. Um, I got to be part of a fundraiser climb last year that actually helped raise funds where I can create outdoor opportunities to get um, BIPOC communities. Because I also think it's not just about educating my people, it's educating all people who go out into those spaces. Millions and millions of people visit Mount Tahoma, but yet have no idea about the tribes and the knowledge and the traditional plant knowledge. And so, um, yeah, I, like I said, I recently got to take a group of Muckleshoot tribal members up to hike. And that was awesome because none of them had ever hiked on Mount Rainier in that way. And um, Mount Rainier National Park has been really resourceful and helpful in creating those spaces, like meeting us out there and sharing more about the mountain and also creating relationships, you know, with myself and, you um, you know, and the other climbers, you know, to be comfortable out in those spaces. But I hope that there's more to come to create, you know, just even lowland hikes, you know, on the mountain and educate people out there. Um, I know it's something that we'll be doing and I'm hoping that, you know, we'll get the chance to do it with some of these other groups, you know, again, with, you know, REI and Washington National Parks Fund and, um, yeah, and getting youth out is extremely important. And so I'm always working with, you know, our tribal programs to get our folks out there. And so maybe I'll get the chance to expand, you know, beyond that. And I know the work that Gil does as well, you know, working in tribal courts and being able to get, you know, our youth out in those spaces and educating them. Because again, it's not just about being on the mountain. There's so much healing that comes from it. When we think about our mental health, when we think about our physical health, when we think about our relationship with the land and it's about wellness. And I believe wellness is the components of mind, body, and spirit. And, you know, when we go out into spaces like the mountain, you know, we get to, you know, heal and, and work on all of that. That's beautifully said. Can you remind me again, what was the name of your company? The Earth Gym. Earth Gym. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll add that to uh, our show notes at the end. Yeah. Okay, well, it is time to wrap up, folks. Um, I truly appreciate the three of you taking time out of your day to share your stories and experiences and for celebrating Native American Heritage Month with us. And as well, thank you to everyone else in the audience for joining us for another wonderful virtual field trip. If you'd like to see other episodes of our virtual field trips, find us on YouTube. Um, just search Washington's National Park Fund or this handle right here. Um, we've got so many episodes, so many different projects that we fund and document and showcase to our audience. Another thing to check out is our project portfolio, wnpf.org slash projects. It showcases our current projects that we fund and other projects that are fully funded or previously fundraised in the past. Um, all of these projects could not happen without the support of our donors. And one last thing, be sure to mark your calendars for November 28th. It is Giving Tuesday. It's a global day of giving, and we hope that you can join us in supporting projects in Washington's three national parks. Gifts can support things like meadow restoration, projects that embrace inclusion of underrepresented communities, critical wildlife research, and so much more. All gifts up to $15,000 will be matched thanks to the Tide Southwest Foundation, which means that your impact will double. Um, you can find more about Giving Tuesday on our homepage at wnpf.org. Thank you so much again, Gil, Mercedes, and Rachel. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing how your climb goes next summer, and let's stay in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.